Hello, let's talk about surgical extraction of an impacted mandibular wisdom tooth. You can see this is not quite a horizontal impaction, but almost a horizontal impaction. How do you take this tooth out? Well, let's first talk about it on the radiograph. In a perfect world, if it's a horizontal impaction, you cut the coronal part of the tooth off and then you move it forward. You move the roots forward and take them out in a second part. Now, if it's not a complete horizontal impaction, you're just going to section this part and take out the front part and then the back part. Remember, you've always got to have a space to move a tooth into. If you tried to remove this tooth and it's wedged against the second molar and also has bone on the coronal or the upper side of the tooth, it doesn't have a space to move into, so you have to create a space. Now, many times people ask me if I use a surgical handpiece or a high-speed handpiece. I use a high-speed handpiece. Now, what's, what's important if you're going to use a high-speed handpiece to section a tooth? What you're trying to avoid is an air embolism. That's when air from the handpiece goes into the lingual, typically it's the lingual side of a tooth under the lingual soft tissue and creates a pocket where it puffs up. I mean, it's not the end of the world if it's happened, if it does happen, but if you press that, it sounds like packing paper. It goes crack, 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 and eventually it'll go away, but you'd rather not have it happen. I guess if you had too much of it. It could be an issue. I'm really not sure what it is, but the, the significant thing is you don't reflect the lingual flap past the attached gingiva. I'm going to repeat that. You do not reflect the lingual flap in the mandible into the unattached gingiva. You keep the flap attached to the alveolar process by not reflecting all of the attached gingiva make it nice and snug there, and then you, you, in 40 years, I've never had an air embolism. The other thing about using a high-speed handpiece, if you're cutting bone, you want to use a light touch and lots of water because you don't want to burn the bone, and you won't if you just use a light touch and lots of water. Now, I try to cut the tooth and not the bone when I can, which is 90% of the time because I'm losing the tooth anyway. So when I section this tooth, the cut is going to be through here. If you can cut it like this, that's even better because the coronal part of the piece you're removing is thinner than the apical part. And then you should be able to just pop that apart and elevate that out and then move the distal part of the impacted tooth forward. Okay, so painless and profound mandibular local anesthesia. So I'm actually taking out all four teeth, but in this video, we're just going to show you how a, a method of removing the lower left impacted mandibular wisdom tooth. Now, I always like to give an intraligamental. If you've watched my videos, you know that's a major part of profound local anesthesia is the intraligamental. Watch the video on that. With the intraligamental, you want the bevel toward the tooth in the sulcus. And I'll apply pressure both on the lingual and the facial for about 20 seconds. Just not killer pressure, but just good firm pressure so that that local anesthesia goes down into the periodontal ligament space and you know that tooth is dead numb. So here's the intraligamental. You can see the wisdom tooth back here. So I'm making an incision up the ramus of the mandible on the facial side of the tooth. It's going to slide right into the sulcus on the facial side of the tooth. Now I'm creating a distal wedge back here. Now don't cut way onto the lingual. You, you don't have to worry about the lingual nerve if you'll just keep it within the confines of the tooth. That second cut is to the distal distal lingual of the wisdom tooth. So you've got this wedge which makes suturing the flaps more effective. The flap will come together if you cut a distal wedge if you're removing the most distal tooth in the arch. Dr. D. Lamar Bird taught me that method when I was in my oral surgery fellowship. The distal wedge if you're extracting a terminal tooth in an arch. 
So then we're using the scissors and just cutting up the ramus of the mandible and reflecting only the flap on the, the facial side. If you can, you're keeping the flap in attached gingiva. So this is a about a number four or six round burr. And since I need to move the tooth in this direction, you've got to create a little space on the distal of the tooth so you have somewhere to move the tooth into. If you've got bone on this side of the tooth and you try to elevate the tooth, it can't go anywhere because that bone's holding it up. Now, I'm cutting the tooth as much as I'm cutting the bone with very light pressure and lots of water because I'm going to lose this tooth anyway. Now think about it. I need space to move the tooth in too. So if you cut the tooth, that also is creating space. It's cutting up the ramus of the mandible. See, so the tooth is pointing in this direction. So I want to remove this part of the tooth and then move the apical or the apical coronal part of the tooth into this space. But I first have to remove the coronal part of the tooth so I have a space to move the roots into. So see how I'm basically just cutting the crown of the tooth off. See, here's the crown, the roots go back that way. So I'm just cutting the crown off. Now I believe this is a, a number four long shank burr, round burr. You want to cut all the way through, at least three quarters of the way through the coronal part of the tooth so you can elevate this and just pop that part off, creating a little space on the facial. See, this is just a small elevator. Now I'm creating a little space on the mesial part of the tooth so I can slide my elevator in there. It's so tight against the tooth, I couldn't place my elevator on the mesial of the wisdom tooth. So I'm creating a little space so I can place my elevator. See, so I've cut, I've separated the crown from the roots, coronal part of the tooth from the roots, and now I'm elevating, since I've created this space on the mesial of the tooth, I'm elevating that coronal piece into the space I've created. Be sure you protect the airway. And now I'm creating a little space on the facial. So I didn't get the entire crown. I, I didn't cut through enough. So you want to be sure you cut all the way through. You're being very conscious of the inferior alveolar nerve always when you're extracting mandibular wisdom teeth. So I'm viewing this cut with my occlusal mirror and seeing how much I've got to go to get through the tooth so that I've separated the entire coronal part from the roots. I've still got some little part of the crown attached to the roots. So then I'm elevating, and there's that last part. Now, you've got the roots. What do you do about them? You want to create a little space here, and if possible, you'll take a pointed elevator and just move that piece forward. And let's see what we do here. See, I'm very light touch, creating a little space. Now what I'm doing is I'm actually cutting a hole in the coronal part of those roots. And this is a pointed elevator, and I'm moving that piece forward. So I'm using this pointed elevator and moving those roots. See, I put a hole in the top of the roots, between the roots, and the more you can slant the hole from distal to mesial, the better. And then you just fulcrum off of the bone, coronal, to the tooth and you move it up into that space. Taking out a horizontally impacted wisdom teeth is always interesting because you first remove the crown. Now you've got a space. Then you make a hole between the roots of the tooth and put that pointed elevator in there and move it forward. And it just pops right out. See, so here's the crown, here's the roots and see the hole I drilled into the root so I could elevate it forward. So I want to irrigate that out and take your rongiers and be sure there's no follicular sac in there. Then I'm going to pack that socket. This is the key to not getting a dry socket. And then I'm going to suture it with 3-0 gut suture. And I'm going to place in a mandibular extraction, I'm going to place either two or three suture. Now, 
This suturing technique is very important. You first wrap three times away from you, pull, then wrap one time towards you, pull, and one time away from you again, pull. If you'll do three the first wrap, the suture won't come loose. If you just do two and you pull, it'll probably loosen up and it won't be as snug as it will be if you do three. Now, if you do three wraps, you need to be sure you keep up with it. See, one, two, three, then pull, and that will stay nice and tight when you do your second one. So your one, two, three, pull. Then one bef towards you, pull. Then another one away from you, pull. So this is the one toward me, the second one. Then one away from me, pull again. You want to leave about a couple of millimeters of suture sticking up after you cut them. Take a deep bite with your needle. One, two, three, pull. One toward me, pull. And then another one away from me, pull. And that's a good tight knot. Normally I just place two. In this one, I'm placing three because I went pretty far up the ramus of the mandible. One, two, three. I rarely place more than one suture when removing a maxillary wisdom tooth. Well, there it is. Now the patient returns in seven days. What's the magic of seven days? It takes seven days for the connective tissue lining to form in the socket. So if a patient's going to get a dry socket, they're going to get it within the first seven days, 99% of the time. I'm not going to get a dry socket because I pack the socket and that stabilizes the blood clot so it doesn't come out. That's what a dry socket is if the patient loses the blood clot. They don't occur in maxillary wisdom teeth extraction or rarely would that happen. They occur in mandibular wisdom teeth extractions. So by placing the medicated mesh in the mandibular socket at the time of extraction that stabilizes the blood clot so they don't lose the blood clot, exposing the nerve endings in the bone. So if the patient makes it seven days without a dry socket, they're 99% chance they're not going to get one because that connective tissue lining is formed over the bone in the socket. So now the patient returns after seven days and we're going to give them this scutan monojec syringe to irrigate the mandibular sockets with. They don't have to irrigate the maxillary wisdom teeth sockets because gravity is working for you in the maxilla so food doesn't pack in there but they need to irrigate the mandibular sockets after seven days. How long do they irrigate it? Until the hole closes and they can't get the tip of the syringe in the socket. So this is a mixture of about half mouthwash and half warm water. Now I tell the patient, follow the incisal edge of the, t occlusal edge of the teeth, back off the distal part of the second molar and it'll just slip right into that little hole of the socket and you're not pushing it in forcibly, you're just filling up the socket and letting any food debris that's in the socket float to the top. And they do this once a day before bedtime. They don't need to do it four times a day until that tissue closes. So that's the dental minute. These techniques work and they work every time. Take your practice to the top tier. Subscribe to DentistryMasterclasses.com for an organized library of all the Dental Minute videos, plus many complete comprehensive cases and many very important articles. New cases are added weekly, only $20 per month. Subscribe now.